Hello and welcome to Point of View. I'm Tanya Nugent and thanks for joining us today on this program where we share thoughts and ideas, celebrate achievements and explore issues that matter to women. As always, I'd like to welcome my fellow panellists. Today we have Isabel Drummer stepping in for Cleopatra. Nice to have you on the set, Thank Izzy. You. Thank you for having me. And Phil McKellagai, as always, ever reliable, always here. <laughs> Phil McKellagai, <laughs> welcome. You. Our special guest today is 2015 Australian of the Year and prominent anti-violent campaigner, uh, Rosie Batty. Rosie is in Papua New Guinea to raise awareness on family and sexual violence and increase support for local NGO Family PNG and its work addressing family and sexual violence based out of Ley. Rosie's personal story is one of heartbreak and courage, and she'll be sharing some of her journey with us today, as well as some of Australia's experiences in responding to family and sexual violence. Rosie, welcome to Papua New Guinea and welcome to Point of View. Thank you. Thank you for being with us this morning. Your story is one that I am sure will touch many women and families in, in Papua New Guinea. Uh, and resonate, and uh, we will get to that shortly. But first, um, is this your first time in Papua New Guinea? And and what are your what were your perceptions? And and how how's it been? <laughs> um, look, it's <clears throat> it's uh, it is definitely my first time to Papua New Guinea. Um, certainly, um, I've been here um, just a very brief period of time. I've packed in as much as I can. I've met as many people as I can, but it's certainly not enough time. And um, it's clear to me from the wonderful people I've met that um, I do need to plan another trip. Yeah, most people say that, don't they, when they yes. come here? There's never enough time. The first time's always a bit of a whoa. What, um, what did you know of um, us before you came here? Um, look, I would say that uh, my knowledge of Papua New Guinea is probably like very many typical Australians. We know about the Kokoda Trail and we know about um, that history and, and the relationships we have with Papua New Guinea in relation to um, um, that area. And um, so I know quite a few people who've been here to do the Kokoda Trail. Um, I'm not fit enough currently to try it myself. <laughs> but, um, you know, I suppose the other thing that I know about Papua New Guinea is there are very high rates of violence and um, it has, you know, been something that um, I feel um, incredulous that um, women here experience it um, you know two out of three women is what I understand and that is you know really huge and um, you know the message I have here is that Australia is a very lucky beautiful country too but we have family violence in our own communities and currently we know there are one in three women affected by physical violence and um, you know, my message really is that this is a global issue. It's not just a Papua New Guinea issue, um, and it's something that you know I'm really keen to to share um, the experiences that I have in Australia and um, and see how that may offer some kind of assistance here as well. Where did you visit while you were here? Where did you go? I've been in Port Moresby, but I certainly went down to Lay. Okay. So I spent a couple of days in Ley and, and looking, um, meeting with um, organisations down there and, and the University of Technology there and we had a wonderful fundraising dinner and um, so that's, and, and Family PMG's office is in Ley so I met victim survivors um, who were inspired and encouraged and really wanted to share their experiences with me after hearing my story and knowing that um, um, you know my journey um, that, that really give, gave them the courage um, to want to speak out and in a safe supportive environment and that was really humbling. And what did you think of the people when you got here? Oh, the people are amazing you know that's um, I've met both men and women you know they're warm they're vibrant they're strong they're resilient they're happy well, you know, they're very, in, you know, it's really easy to get a really positive, warm feeling about Papua New Guinea, for sure. Um, and I'm just amazed by the Papua New Guinean women, truly amazed. Did you get to see any of our culture on display? Did, did you have time or will you come back for that? Next trip. We'll, we'll go to the Anger Show together, yeah? That's right. <laughs> That's right. I have to say that Family PNG put on a, um, a welcoming cultural um, welcome for me which was really 
um, did bring tears to my eyes. Oh, it good. looked beautiful and I was very honoured, incredibly honoured mm. um, and very humbled because that's not what you expect and it realises mm how important people consider your visit to be. And yes. you know, when you come all the way from Australia and you, you know, you don't know how you may be received and you're very keen to make sure that um, you come, you're welcomed and, 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 um, and appreciate the hospitality mm -hmm. shown to you. Speaking of tears and emotion, what was it like, um, that exchange of sharing the stories with the women here? How, how did you find that? Oh, I think um, so many women, certainly in Australia, it's, it's been something that, you know, experiencing violence um, has been something that you feel that you need to um, keep silent, um, you, you feel ashamed. And a lot of your family and friends don't understand, they don't know what to say, they don't know how to help you. And sometimes the advice you're given is not helpful and it, it can make you feel less, you know, less really disempowered. And, and um, so for these people who have never met me before to have, to feel comfortable enough to, to share their stories, many of which are still experiencing the violence, mm -hmm. um, you want to fix it. <laughs> you wish that you had a magic wand and that you could just fix it but you can't and you know I know they don't expect me to but that's what you want to be able to mm. to do so it's hard to listen mm. it's hard to listen um, but you know we all get great courage in sharing our stories and you know what we really need to be able to do is support people and learn how to do that rather than be critical of them and judge them and look down on people um, you know these are the experiences that victims in Australia have and so with my story um, and the way I've been able to create change in Australia by my story being heard, um, you know, it gives others the courage and the feeling that they too can speak out. Fantastic. We need to just take a very quick break um, now. And when we return, Rosie Batty will be sharing her story how a tragedy in her life has turned her into a tower of strength and in inspiration for many thousands of people who have been touched by family and sexual violence. Stay with us. Welcome back to Point of View. Our guest today is 2015 Australian of the Year and prominent anti-violence campaigner Rosie Batty. Rosie started campaigning against violence in 2014 after her 11-year-old son was murdered by his father. It's a tragic story and before we hear more from Rosie, we're going to show you this short video from the Luke Batty Foundation, which is a foundation Rosie founded named after her son. Melbourne mother Rosie Batty suffered a devastating loss. Her 11-year-old son Luke was bashed and stabbed to death by his father at cricket practice in Tyab, southeast of Melbourne last Wednesday. My son Luke was murdered by his own father at cricket practice. Family violence is every Australian's business. Violence towards anyone, man, woman or child, is never acceptable and never the right choice. It is similarly not okay. I want to tell everybody that family violence can happen to anybody, no matter how nice your house is or how intelligent you are. I started the Luke Buddy Foundation so my son Luke did not die in vain. My mission is to make sure women and children who experience family violence are supported. We will give them a voice and demand our leaders act. Please stand with me beside every victim of family violence. Together, we can make sure they are never alone. So yeah, Rosie, it really has been um, quite a journey um, and if, if perhaps we could start by explaining you know what happened on that day and, and what happened to lead up to 
Um, look, it was in February 2014 and basically uh, my son was murdered by his father um, and, you know, it was at cricket practice and it, it, um, it was something that happened just after most parents had gone. So fortunately, um, or unfortunately, we, we were alone. So um, Luke was murdered um, by a blow to the head and, um, and, um, and other injuries. So um, the next day I, um, I spoke to the media and it was something that I, I don't think I really truly understood what I was doing um, or the impact it would have. Um, but I felt compelled not to run away, but to actually speak out. And um, the statement I made mostly was, um, it doesn't matter how nice your house is or how rich you are, um, family violence can happen to anybody um, along those lines. Mm. And you know, really what I wanted people to understand is I live in a lovely house in a really nice neighborhood and family violence touches women like me because there's a lot of people in Australia would like to think that family violence happens to disadvantaged areas, um, poor neighborhoods, anybody other than people like themselves. You know, in the past three years, I've met many women, judges, magistrates and lawyers, journalists, um, teachers, professional people of all shapes and sizes and cultures and backgrounds, and many have been affected by violence. And it's been a secret that they have kept not speaking out, and many people, including those closest to them, have never known. So, you know, the stigma of experiencing violence in the home has really always been understood to be a secret behind closed doors. And so by me speaking out has been giving people an opportunity to actually bring that conversation out into public, into workplaces, into schools, into communities, into homes. And um, there is a, a lot of ignorance, a lot of judgment, and a lot of misconception in relation to family violence. And so it's by starting these conversations, we can start to feel more, in, be more informed and better educated. And then we are less likely to judge and criticize. I talk a lot in Australia about victim blaming. As communities, we fall automatically into victim blaming and we don't see that we do it. Rather than discussing perpetrators of violence and why they choose violence as a method of power and control, we talk about the victim. We expect them to seek their own safety and take responsibility for their own safety. We create refuges and try to make sure they find a safe passage so that they're not further harmed. We ask questions like, why doesn't she just leave? Mm. The biggest question on the lips of every single person would be, well, why doesn't she just leave? Mm. Somehow blaming her for staying and tolerating the violence. You know, anyone in a violent relationship, you know, understands the courage you need every day to get up and try to have a normal life look after your children, be the best person you can be. There is no weakness in staying. But what we don't always understand is because violence is about power and control, that when a woman does choose to leave, it is mostly out of desperation, mostly out of a realization that the violence has become so extreme and dangerous or her children are being affected or something is escalating and they're driven to often, out of desperation, need to leave. But when they choose to leave often, it is when they are at the most risk of being further harmed or murdered. So my son was murdered even though his father loved him and he wasn't an evil or bad man. He was a normal everyday man, one would say. He was able to murder him out of revenge and the need for power and control, which was stronger than his love. And I don't think any of us can understand that. I will never be able to understand that. But I think what we, we do is kind of demonize that person and think, well, he, 
he must have been a horrible man. And we also automatically blame me and say, well, how could she have let him play with the father? How could we, she have let mm. him have access to the, her son? They blame me. There's only one person to blame. And that's the person who chose to kill, mm. kill him. He never did seek help and he became homeless, unemployed, and his mental illness continued to decline. Mm. There's help available. There are other alternatives. But ultimately, he made his own choices and I was powerless in that path. So for me, I, I feel that um, if I can shift our victim blaming attitudes in community across society, there will be a huge change in attitude. And rather than say, well, why doesn't she just leave? Let's ask, why is he choosing to be violent and discuss the perpetrators of the violence? In Australia, we have one in three women affected by violence, one in four children, and we have at least one woman a week being murdered. Those statistics weren't known. It is, I repeat them every single time I can, and I still talk to people who don't know. Didn't used to be on our televisions, didn't used to be in our newspapers. And when I say about our Aboriginal communities and our Indigenous people in Australia, they are 35 times more likely to be hospitalised and 10 times more likely to be murdered. And they have no voice. They live remotely in isolation and their service responses are poor. So there are a lot of common areas, I feel, and links between Papua New Guinea and Australia. But there are a lot of the differences, you know, are, are that, you know, a lot of Australians are in denial mm -hmm. and don't believe that this is a gendered issue. But our statistics very clearly say and can prove. So, you know, I'm, you know, for us to move forward, it certainly needs the, to work with great men, good role models, because as soon as you start talking in Australia about it being a gendered issue, immediately people say and accuse you of being a man-hater. Mm. Mm. And how can I be a man-hater? I had a son, mm. and I have a father, and mm. I have brothers and uncles, and wonderful male friends. But there is an assumption immediately, I'm a man-hater. Mm. Clearly I'm not. But I do know that men need to be accountable and although we know that some women can be violent too, we cannot move away from the rea stark reality that globally men's violence towards women is a k the key issue here. Mm. And our Prime Minister in Australia actually said a year or so ago with me in public um, on television, not all disrespect of women ends in violence, but all violence begins with disrespect. And I quote that always because I think that is absolutely relevant mm -hmm. across so much of our society and the room for violence towards those who are different in whatever way that, that presents. Mm -hmm. Well, we need to take a quick break now. and Later we'll hear more about Rosie's trip to PNG and the work of Family PNG, who are the organisation that have brought her to our country. But when we return, we'll take a look at the challenges for survivors of family and sexual violence in Papua New Guinea. Welcome back to Point of View. Well, Papua New Guinea is widely believed to have some of the highest rates of domestic violence in the world. And although comprehensive data is really non-existent, the commonly accepted figure we hear is that it's two out of three women in our country who are victims or survivors of family or sexual violence. Human Rights Watch actually estimates that it could be up to 70% of PNG women 
who are raped in their lifetime. With such alarmingly high figures, there is clearly a need for services that respond to victims and, um, and, they, and assist people in the inc incidents of family and sexual violence. Here's a story of one person's experience coming to the aid of his neighbour who was attacked by her husband uh, with a bush knife last Christmas. So what, what were the incidents that led up to the horrific photos that you posted on Facebook about your next door neighbour? Uh, that was Brigitte, the victim. Okay, Brigitte, uh, she don't live at eight years. She resided at uh, Kuriwa, a village along uh, Iritano Highway. Okay, she was with the, with the husband. The husband also had a second wife. Brigida had an argument with the second wife of her husband, and that's when the husband came to the assistant of the second wife and chased uh, Brigida for some distance, and then later attacked her and chopped her. Uh, with the injury, uh, she had to look for means and ways to come, like to come to Mosby, and a relative uh, live at eight years, uh, a biological father. So, so this, she decided to like come to eight years to her father for her father to assist her, and that's when I, I saw her uh, with the in injuries that she sustained. Uh, I feel that I should help in one way or the other. That's why I. Uh, I I ask, uh, like, I come in and I use the Facebook to what, post the uh, injuries or photos, yeah. Were you surprised with some of the response from the social media community? Especially uh, from uh, Austra uh, Australia. That's when uh, the first person to respond was uh, Judy Akison, Professor Judy Akison, yeah. Okay, she was the very first person who responded. And then uh, she keep on uh, uh, like me, uh, sending messages to me uh, and asking me about the latest development and all this stuff. And I, I, I have to like inform her until she got in touch with uh, Katie Porter. And then like Katie Porter came in and everything just was okay, yeah. And what made you pick up the courage to step into this matter? Seeing uh, Brigitte in a uh, in a, in a condition, the, the cut that she sustained was very uh, severe. There were deep cuts, and it was life-threatening. And see in their condition, like, if you were there, you should feel for her too. I, I did, I, I, I feel for her. So I, th I thought to myself, I should uh, do something about it. So I should, uh, like, I first of all, I tried, like, uh, calling uh, St. John's Ambulance and uh, all this stuff, or triple zero and all this stuff, but I didn't get anything out of it. So I have to think uh, outside the box, yeah. How hard was it to get help? She, she did came and uh, reported to Gordon's police station about the injury, but uh, it wasn't of much help, so she had to come to ATS. Uh, and the, from there, when the family tried to uh, seek help, like bringing St. Uh, John's ambulance, uh, there was no response. So she had to spend, uh, send, spend a day out there at uh, ATS without any form of help. And what do you think can be done to improve in the area of existing victims of domestic violence? What do you think that we can improve? All the basic needs. It's from the, like, Currently, I think the victims or the general public, in terms of accidents, generally speaking, uh, uh, they, they come to uh, such organizations where they, they, they tend to like seek uh, assistance, but they, they turn, around, uh, turn away, uh, not uh, like responded to. Such organization like uh, the police, uh, most of the time uh, accidents happen, they come and they report to police thinking that police should uh, uh, come in to assist, but uh, 
all these uh, men seems to be turning blind eyes on them, or they go to the hospitals where the service day is, they don't, even regardless of the, the situation that they're in. Is there anything you'd like to say about gender-based violence or family sexual violence? We must change from our traditional way of doing things and understanding things. Eh? Like before, uh, women are not recognized in the society. Uh, maybe they are recognized, but in a smaller way. The, treat, uh, the husband treat them as a property, or his property, maybe. Uh, but now we are more educated. We should know better that uh, women is a human being, and we should treat them right. Eh? Uh, so. In a world, men's world, you must always treat, a, treat your wife, your daughter, your sister, or whoever, uh, a female. You, you go to have a respect for them uh, and treat them right, yeah. So I got one last question to ask you. What happened to Brigitte? It's disappointing. After all the must assistant, what, the, what we have gone through, Brigitte is back with the husband. That's from the arresting officer. The officer in charge of arresting the husband. So uh, Brigitte is uh, back with the husband, and uh, now I think the tide has got to change. The arresting officer is thinking of arresting Brigitte for harboring the husband. There's certainly a lot to discuss in that story, but we've got to take a quick break now and when we return we'll find out a bit more about the NGO that's been established to assist survivors of family and sexual violence to access the services they need. Stay with us. Welcome back to Point of View. Our guest today is 2015 Australian of the Year and a campaigner against family and sexual violence, Rosie Batty. And Rosie is in the country as a guest of Family PNG, a local NGO based in Ley that runs a case management centre to assist survivors of family and sexual violence to access the services they really need. It targets women, it targets men, children, um, who are survi survivors of intimate partner violence or sexual violence or child abuse. And uh, we're delighted to be able to welcome to the set uh, from Family PNG um, a casework manager, Evan Biesel. Welcome to Point of View, Evan. Thank you, Tanya. So tell us a little bit about the work that uh, you do with Family PNG. Um, basically, Family PNG is an NGO, like what you have said, and we we kind of like provide case management, mm -hmm. effective case management services to the survivors of gender-based violence, especially family sexual violence survivors. Mm -hmm. And also we are providing this uh, partnership mm -hmm. with the service providers. Mm -hmm. So what are the kinds of services that survivors require? There are a lot of services when survivors, when beaten, they, they need. And it's kind of like, it, it depends on the presentation. If they come, if they have been beaten physically, then they need attention. Or even if they are abused sexually, then they need medical assistance. So we kind of like, we refer them to Family Support Center. We have our service providers which are there. Family Support Center where they receive free medical services. And at the same time, if they need uh, legal assistance, there are services available that they go there and get the protection order and starts. And if they, if they also need the social services, social welfare services, then we also refer to the community development officers who assisted them there. Okay. You're located in Ley, you said? Uh, Actually, yes, mm. we are located in okay. Ley. What part of Ley are you at? We are right in town. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and for the services that you provide, have you seen uh, when, when you began? What year did you begin and how is the, uh, number of people, like has it increased, has it decreased, how have you, how has uh, it been? Family PNG actually started in 2014, in June, and when we started, we only saw clients of very high risk, and we do safety assessment on them, and after doing the assessment risk, we kind of like identified a need needed at that time. 
so we assist them accordingly and to date we will, we will be three years old by June this year and we have almost seen thousand plus clients Wow! there have been an increase of numbers of survivors coming forth wow. to access services and we also have this referral referral pathway which is very clear and we kind of like receive referrals from our partners mm -hmm. as well as us uh, referring the clients to them. Mm -hmm. What's the biggest need you find for your clients? I think the biggest need was uh, in the beginning there was no clear referral pathway and women and children and men couldn't access the services. Even the government services were there but unfortunately the, 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 the referral pathway was not clear. Yeah. And when Family PNG came on board, it was kind of like a revival. It mm. strengthened the partnership. Mm. When I said strengthen the partnership, like, you know, some of the government services, they don't, have, uh, they don't have resources. So we kind of like support by funding computer, printer, to make their work easier. Mm. And at the same time, calling up co-stakeholders meeting and making them aware of these survivors and they need to access those services and at the same time making them accountable, mm. responsible to take care of those survivors. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned medical, obviously that's the immediate critical yes. need when someone's been physically harmed. But then what about things like um, if they are in a situation where they need to get away from a violent partner and they've got nowhere to go? Um, what, what if they've got, you know, you know the emotional um, trauma that happens and and then of course what about seeking justice for what's happened to them are these part of the services actually Tanya we we provide all these services when I said a risk assessment that's mm. where we come into we get our client we intake them and we assess them and when we assess them we do a safety planning as well and if their safety at risk not to return back to the place that they come from we refer to the other partners who are providing the safe house accommodation. Okay. So that's where we support them with necessary needs like mm -hmm. clothing, the food that they need, the logistic. Mm -hmm. And when it comes for them, according to their, we work according to their plans. If they want to seek justice, then we work according to their plans and we help them to access the service. Mm -hmm. And once it's been done, if one of their options, one of their options is to return back to their family, to a safe home, then we facilitate that by providing, uh, we do up a repatriation plan and we do some um, economical assistance with them. We don't give in cash, mm -hmm. but according to their strength, we can provide something for them to start up and benefit from there. Do you have, um, you know, in terms of the, the the husband or whoever the partner do you have services that involve him or her to in terms of communication and building that relationship again counseling in their house or in their homes uh, especially for family png we are only focused on the survivors but when i said the other partners strengthening the other service providers then we refer we kind of like if it is uh, if they need counseling services then there is family life available that we refer them to or even social welfare we refer them to access those services there. But we kind of like providing the only, we are focusing only on the survivors. And is yeah. there more young, uh, how's the statistics like? Is there more young, getting uh, young victims or is there more older victims? Just speaking in terms of the young girls out there, I know a few of my friends out there who experience a lot of violence. What's put in place for the younger females? Like how do they pick themselves up? Because they start at a younger age where they're getting you know, abused, and they don't know where to go, and they don't know who to see, and they're young girls. I'm talking 17, 16, and they could go to their parents, yeah, sure, but there's no refuge there. What do they, what's, what's been in place for these young girls? Uh, we have been seeing a lot of survivors, and through this awareness program, like, uh, we have this course take all this meeting, and we kind of like making these services uh, aware to the service providers and if they happen to come across to such survivors if they need our assistance they can be referred to so we kind of like open we're open for any 
And we've seen a lot of young girls coming forth to talk about and seek assistance and been referred, assist, we assisted them by referring, referring them to the services that they need. When we were at the University of Papua New Guinea yesterday, um, I was, they showed me um, there's a number that people can call yes. um, for counselling support and I think that that would be, um, certainly in Australia we do have the same, but a lot of people don't know about it. And I think that, you know, I spend a lot of time also trying to encourage people to, to know what that number would be. Um, and now, certainly on our televisions, when we discuss mm. family violence, that number is, you know, is communicated in, um, for people to, to know where to reach that help. Mm. Um, and certainly there are those facilities and supports within the, the, within the university as well. So that, that's some kind of avenue, I think, um, because it is really important for young people to be able to understand what do they do and how can they help a friend that may be in that situation. Yeah. That's a very good point and we do need to take a break and we will give you that number if you are seeking help and counselling for family and sexual violence. The phone number you can call is the One Talk Counselling Helpline. It's a national hotline. The number is 7150 7150-8000. And we'll put that number up on the screen again at the end of the program. And uh, we might also throw up some information there about how you can contact the people at Family PNG. Don't go away, we'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to Point of View and we have our first international guest on the program today. So it got me thinking of course about what people outside of our country think of us. Uh, what is our country's image internationally? What are we known for? And we touched on it earlier but is there anything that you had in your perception that has been changed since you've been here in our country? Look I was told it was a beautiful and a stunning country but the rates of violence were very concerning. Um, my perception is still the same, although I've yet to continue to see more of Papua New Guinea, mm. but it is beautiful and the people are beautiful. Mm. I've actually, one of the one thing I, I can say is th that I have met many men here who have been incredibly keen to meet with me and have not been afraid of coming to the events and hearing me speak. And, and so I've been really encouraged at the engagement of men during my visit and how they are also very supportive yeah. um, too. That's really good to hear, really good to mm. hear. Well, I found this actually, this really cool map online called International Number Ones because every country is best at something. So, you know, we've been talking about all the things that are bad about PNG and it's always nice to try and, you know, remind ourselves that we do have some cool um, things going on here and there are some other cool countries as well. So this is the game, it's called What Country Is Best At? And I'll give you the uh, multiple choice answer. So what country, question number one, what country is best at medical research? Is it A, Jordan, B, Israel, or C, the USA? Let's start over here with you, Evan. C. C, USA. That's what I would say too. <laughs> yeah, C for um, Rosie, is Izzy? I'll probably go with C, yeah. And yeah, I'll go with Israel then. Okay. Okay, I'm just going to say, yes, it's, it's Israel. Um, and Jordan is actually known for refugees and the USA mm -hmm. is best at spam emails. <laughs> <laughs> According to this map. Okay, question number two. What country is best at Brazil nuts? Is it A, Brazil, B, <laughs> Peru, or C, Bolivia? Can't be Brazil because that would seem so obvious, but I'll still say Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? B. B. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'll Philly. say Bolivia. Yeah, I think I'll go with Philly and say Bolivia. Yes. Mm. The answer is Bolivia. Brazil is famous for sugar, is best at sugar, and Peru is best at cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question number three. What country is best at pizza eating? Is it A, Canada, B, Italy, or C, Norway? I would have said the USA based on the size of their people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Probably B, I'll go with B. I would say C. I would go for B. 
Canada. The answer is actually C, Norway, which is really wow. weird, right? I can just Scandinavians mm, eating yeah. pizza. Well, it's a very cold country, and I think pizza would be very uh, quick and hot. <laughs> yeah. And Canada and is best at personal freedom. Woohoo! Mm. And Italy, believe it or not, best at kiwi fruit. Work that out. Mm. I don't know. Wow. <laughs> okay. Best at eating them or growing them? <laughs> Probably growing them, I think. Must oh. be the Mediterranean I thought climate. that was New Zealand. Yeah, same. <laughs> Okay, number four, cheapest petrol. What country is best at the cheapest petrol? Is it A, Venezuela, B, Saudi Arabia, or C, Australia? I'll go with B. B, Saudi Arabia? B. B, Saudi? It's not Australia, it's B. Yeah. <laughs> B? It's definitely it's not up. Australia. <laughs> I will, I'll say Venezuela for no other reason other than it's A. It's out <laughs> there. Well, the cheapest f petrol is found in Venezuela. That's the correct answer. Okay. Um, Saudi Arabia is known <laughs> for arms imports and Australia is known for cyber security incidents. <laughs> Question number five. Which country is known for Scrabble players? Is it A, Nigeria, B, United Kingdom or C, Ireland? Well, my grandmother um, was a passionate Scrabble player, so I'm going to put my money on be United Kingdom. How about you? I'll go with Nigeria. The answer actually is A, Nigeria, oh. believe it or not. I was so surprised. Maybe they just have lots of Scrabble players. Whether they're any good at it or not is a different question. <laughs> I suppose that was a different question. Yeah, yeah. um, and the United Kingdom is, um, does billionaires. Damn. Billionaires oh. the best and Ireland is working conditions. Oh. So that, that means England has the most billionaires. Yes. Gosh. UK, wow. yeah. Apparently, yes. Okay, I'm going to change it around a bit and, and I'll say the country and then you have to guess which one of these th three things is from this country. Mm. So the first country, Egypt, is best <coughs> at A, female genital mutilation, B, uh, B child labour or C, heavy women. Wow. Child labour? Ch what do you think? I want to say heavy women. A, B or C? I think C. Yes, that's correct. Wow. Heavy women. Female genital mutilation is actually Somalia's big <coughs> um, thing, yeah. and child labor is Eritrea. Yeah. yeah. So, number seven, Indonesia. Is Indonesia do, does Indonesia do rice? A, B, coconuts, or C, pepper? I would have said rice. Rice? Chili? I, I think I'll say rice too. Evan? A. A, rice. Actually, it's coconuts. Oh, wow. Um, Thailand is rice and pepper is Vietnam. Wow. <laughs> Vietnam does pepper really well. <coughs> you know that. Okay, Namibia. Does Namibia do um, A, car crashes, B, child mortality, or C, diamonds? I'd say diamonds. Diamonds? What do you reckon, Philly? Oh, yeah, maybe diamonds too. Okay, we all love diamonds. Everyone? Yes. <laughs> diamonds, yeah. Okay, the answer is actually A. Namibia yeah. is best at car crashes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh. Um, Angola is child mortality and Botswana does diamonds best. Just oh. FYI, oh. everyone. Wrong African country, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Question number nine. Um, El Salvador does what best? Lemons, uh, least police, <laughs> or velociraptors? <laughs> what is the velociraptor? Is, is that a dinosaur? They're the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, you know, the creepy ones with the. Yeah, so, okay. which one is it, El Salvador? I'll say the least police. Least police. I'm going to go velociraptors because it's a cool word to say. <laughs> yeah, at least you can <laughs> say it. <laughs> what do you think, Ivan? I just guess. Yeah. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Lemons, no. And the answer is least police. El Salvador yeah. has the least police. Uh, lemons is <coughs> Mexico. Mexico does lemons so? best. Mm -hmm. And Mon Velociraptors is Mongolia. <laughs> really? Mongolia <laughs> does not exist. Well, I guess they've got um, all the remains in the deserts of right. Mongolia. That's oh, where they are. Okay. Okay, final question. Number 10, Papua New Guinea. What do we do best? Is it A, rubber gloves, B, mahogany, or C, diversity? Well, I've been <laughs> in Papua New Guinea only five days, but I have not seen anybody wearing rubber gloves. <laughs> I'm pleased to say. <laughs> so I'm going to say C, diversity, definitely. Yeah, what do you think? Definitely. So yeah, I'm going to say D, everything. We're pretty good at everything. <laughs> but for you, I'll say C, diversity. <laughs> well, that's it. That's an easy one. Of course, yeah. it is diversity. And it was really nice to see a map of the world 
um, <coughs> and see all the things that these different countries are best at and to see us on there. So, such a beautiful thing as diversity. By the way, Malaysia is rubber gloves. I was going to say, but you have to tell us yes. who, who <laughs> wears the most and, rubber and, gloves. And mahogany? And, and that's Fiji. Oh, yeah, wow. Fiji mahogany. Okay. Yeah. So there you go. That's what this, these countries do best in the world. And yes, PNG is right up there with diversity. We've got to take a quick break now and we'll be back very shortly to wrap things up. Stay with us. Welcome back everybody and we've got just enough time for our rapid final wrap up where everybody gets to say their final two toys worth. Uh, I might start with you Filma. What's your final say? Uh, well, uh, it's a very good uh, good segment today. Really enjoyed it. Thank you for coming on, uh, Miss Miss Betty, and thank you everyone also. Um, I'd like to just point out how violence and family violence and all this is something that is not uh, something that exists just in PNG. It's around the world. It's a global issue, and it affects everyone uh, from every kind of lifestyle and every kind of. Uh, social status. So you're not alone if you're experiencing anything like this and um, services that that Advanced uh, Family PNG provide is, is something that's accessible um, and you can go to people for help. You can uh, ring the hotline that I think we're going to put up on the screen later but it's really um, it's really good to know that we, we're not alone in what we face. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I would like to say that uh, family violence and sexual violence is not uh, an individual issue. It's everybody's business, so let's all tap into that and support one another. If we hear or if we see, there are services available and we can always refer them for assistance. Mm -hmm. There are services available, meaning that they can access, so <coughs> please, we should assist in that area. Mm -hmm. I, I, I agree. <coughs> um, it, it is not just a Papua New Guinea issue. It is an Australian issue. It is a global issue. And um, what I would like to say is that um, we need the violence to stop. And what a shame that Papua New Guinea is known for, for that, when there is so much more, there's so much more, and so many more strands, and so many more, much more beautiful things than to be known for the high violence. And the part that we need to pay in this is that we need man. This is not a woman's issue, this is a man's issue. And it is really about the violence stopping and working with men to make that violence stop. So we all play a part, but men are a critical part in this too. Yeah, very, very true. It will not change unless the men can come on this journey with us and change it. Um, and I also want to also encourage people to speak out. Just don't don't feel that don't feel that shame. Um, it's easy to say, but. Um, it's easier said than done, but yeah, it, it, the more we keep this this a silent um, thing, the more it will continue. It'll just feed, and it'll never we'll never be able to address it. So just encourage everybody to speak out. And that number again, the One Talk Counselling Helpline is seven one five zero eight triple zero. Thank you very much, everybody. That's our show for today. Rosie, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you, you in our country and to have you on our program. Thank you very much. Very important message. Izzy, thank you as well. I know thank you've had you the flu, um, but thank you also for filling in for Cleo. Mm -hmm. Philly, thank, thank you, you very much as yeah. always. And everyone from Family PNG, thank you for the wonderful work you do and all the very best. Um, and we hope that our viewers in Lay will now be more aware of the work that you do. And thank you also to everybody out there for joining us on Point of View. We'll be back again next time. Until then, it's bye for now. <laughs>